Okay, so welcome back, everybody, to the 2022 Sociology of Guns lecture on the human weapon relationship. In part one, we went a little bit meta. Uh, we talked a little bit about my personal life. We talked about the liberal gun owner's mission. And we talked a little bit about social cognition and human cognition, all very important things to establish before we go into talking about this long-standing relationship between humans and weapons, particularly humans and projectiles. Again, this is a lecture that is designed for undergraduate college students, most of which have no relationship with firearms, most of which will lean towards being more liberal in the contemporary sense where their only relationship with firearms is going to be through the news and through negatives and through, uh, that is firearms related negatives and through potentially the desire to do something about firearms related negatives. So that's the reason why in the intro, I covered the topics that I covered. And it's important to state here that one of the issues that we have in this society, I would argue on both sides of the gun or firearms ownership public safety nexus, is that humans don't go very deep into understanding the phenomenon or both of the phenomena that are related to what we're dealing with. So people don't go very deep into firearms ownership rights or the relationship between humans and weapons. And people don't go very deep into firearms related injury and death or firearms related negatives. You'll have to excuse me, uh, the weather's changing and my sinuses and my mouth and my lungs are getting a little bit challenged. So. I um I will be taking sippy doodles uh throughout uh throughout the lecture today. So people don't go very deep and the argument here is that if we're going to have this playing field, if we're going to have this game table, if we're going to have this pool table where we are working a game between firearms ownership rights and public safety, which we are, then my hypothesis is let's start from the fair playing field and let's have the best information available. And so where does that best information start? Well, first and foremost, it's going to start with human nature because guns and weapons are, don't exist uh, in some hermetically sealed reality away from the internal state of humans. They're a reflection of the internal state of humans. Okay, so all things that we see in society and in the world emanate from the human mind and human behavior. So in order to understand anything, I'm not sure why people don't understand that that's the first place that you go. You should go into the human mind and into human behavior. Excuse me. So we have in front of us Hobbes and Rousseau, Enlightenment, uh, European Enlightenment philosophers. Uh, and this is their commentary on human nature. Thomas Hobbes. No arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear of danger and violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Jean-Jacques Rousseau takes the other side of the issue of human nature. Nothing is more gentle than man in his primitive state, as he is placed by nature at equal distance from the stupidity of brutes and the fatal ingenuity of civilized man. So, 
Hobbes is saying we are a ruined race of beings, that we are devils. And Jean-Jacques Rousseau is saying that man, humans in their basic state, outside of the tangles of contemporary society, are just going to rest into this peaceful and benevolent state, right? So the angel. So Hobbes is saying that we've got the devil on the shoulder, and Rousseau is saying we've got the angel on the shoulder, right? So what is the reality with human nature? Well, it is my opinion that the discerning person will come to the conclusion that we have both of those things. And many philosophers for thousands of years on this planet have come to the same conclusion, that we contend with both of those aspects of ourself, for ourselves. We know that we have a more primitive aspect to our brain, and we know that we have a little bit more advanced aspect to our brain, executive functioning, advancement, and then we have the primitive part. We always contend with this as, as Homo sapiens. This is always with us. There's never a time where we don't have these two basic forces working within us. Let's go back to Jonathan Haidt and the rider and the elephant. That's exactly what the rider and the elephant is talking about. So in terms of human nature, we have these two uh, aspects. And this is something that we need to understand. Fundamentally, if we are to understand why it is that humans do weapons. This next slide, I'm definitely going to need a sip for this. It is something that I have devised. Uh, the sociological anthropological synthesis for projectile weapons universality, the Yamani Shea synthesis. So when we're dealing with the work of David Yamani, we are dealing with a sociologist and he is looking at the contemporary reality through the proximate lens of sociology. David's looking at the now. He might be looking back a little bit into the 19th or 18th century, and he may be prognosticating a little bit into the future. But for the most part, David is looking at the now, and that's very important when we look at the now and study the now. But as we have discussed previously in the other lecture, the previous lecture, the proximate lens can become a prison. And our proximate tendency with our brains, just to take the quick take and look at things uh, in the, the most direct route, uh, can oftentimes keep us from understanding fully that which we are studying or looking at. So it's important to also go all the way back to the origin uh, point for a phenomenon or to go back uh, or to go, you don't even have to do it relative to a timeline. You can just go wider. Okay. So here we have the Yamani Shea synthesis. Excuse me. So David Yamani is doing guns are normal. Normal people use guns. And John J. Shea, Dr. John J. Shea, says that projectiles are a human cultural universal. Dr. Shea is a, a paleoanthropologist and an archaeologist. So if we are looking at this phenomenon, the relationship between humans and weapons is universal, and it is purely universal from the very emergence of our species all the way until right now. And it will likely, predictably, be a universal in the future, because it is, has always been a universal for humans. A universal is not an absolute. It doesn't mean every single individual. It means it's spread out pretty evenly amongst cultures. No matter what your cultural measurement is, you're going to find that humans universally are involved in weaponry, specifically projectiles. So. Dr. Shea starts at the human origin, 
and comes until now, and says that projectiles are a human cultural universal, and and David Yamati is saying guns are normal, normal people use guns. Do you want to understand the reality of guns? Then you need to understand projectile weapons universality. Okay, and this slide is here for people to use. Uh, we have uh, David's as the proximate lens. Dr. Shea is the ultimate lens. At, in regards to this work, particularly, uh, David and I, David represents the proximate lens, and I represent the ultimate lens. I am the one that's introducing into the gun world the ultimate lens, and that is something that will be what I represent in the future relative to education. Anthropologic universality. This is Dr. Shea's quote. Projectile weaponry is uniquely human and culturally universal. We are the only species that uses projectile weaponry, and no human society has ever abandoned its use. Everywhere that humans have been and everywhere that we go, everywhere that we reproduce and everywhere that we survive, we take weapons with us or create weapons, or rediscover the creation of weaponry. So every measurement of our behavior, oral, every, I'm sorry, every, every record of our behavior, right, that exists, the oral record, the written record, the archaeological record, the artistic record, and the modern records of audio and video, Every single record of our behavior is chocked full of this relationship. Okay, it's always with us because it is a universal, right? It is spread out amongst our groups. Uh, it's spread out right now. Uh, everywhere that you go in this country where you are in a significant population center, you are surrounded by weapons. That's the way that humans role. Anthropologic continuity. So universality and continuity, very important. Anthropology is not just the past, it is also the present and the future. There is a historical, predictable, observable pattern in the creation of projectile by humans. The experiences related to each weapons type feeds the production of the future weapons type. Firearms do not exist outside of this anthropologic progression. Firearms are not just a socio-political historical phenomenon. They are also an anthropologic projectile delivery technology tied to prehistoric human behavioral vectors. Guns didn't drop out of the sky from Jesus, so George Washington picked them up. And then we have the beauty of America and Ted Nugent. That's not real. This whole thing doesn't belong to white people. It doesn't belong to Europeans. It belongs to the species. And the AR-15 is not outside of this relationship. If the microlithic engineers of South Africa 70,000 years ago what could have created an AR-15, they sure as hell would have. So seeing guns as some Paul on society that's outside of the normal weapons relationship that humans have, um, well, the normal relationship that humans have with weapons, historically, anthropologically, seeing it outside of that is entirely um, inaccurate, disingenuous. So this, there's a continuity that happens with us and weapons technology, and it starts in prehistory, and it goes into the historical uh, era, and it's going to go into the future. In order to understand the human weapon, relation, the human weapon relationship, we need to start to understand <clears throat> evolutionary theory a little bit. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't really care if a person believes in a religion or um, believes in science or it doesn't matter but if you're at the point where 
you don't at least consider the possibility that what we are as a species didn't just drop out of the sky 10,000 years ago or pop up out of the ground 10,000 years ago. You need to get beyond that uh, in order for me to take you seriously. We come from beings that were behind us, all right? And the idea that all of the beings that were behind us, that fed into us being here, the idea that all of those people were white and European and and look and and Jesus looked like Kenny Loggins like that reality is not that's not real that's not a scientifically um substantial or legitimate reality we came from beings that are behind us in the timeline so based upon the best science that we have this hominin timeline is something that i just put up if you're talking about evolutionary theory Excuse me. This is what we're going to be dealing with. Uh, there's a human chimp ancestor about uh, six to eight million years ago. Humans and chimpanzees branch off from that. And humans go in one direction. And chimpanzees go in the other direction. By the way, what is a hominin? A hominin is all homo species and chimpanzees. There are only two hominins left on the planet right now, and that is us, homo sapiens, and chimpanzees, and bonobos are related to chimpanzees. So there are only two hominins left on the planet. That's us and chimps. We have early hominin ancestors, 1.4 to 2.8 million years ago, homo habilis, australopithecines, these are beings that we find in the archaeological record. Uh, Homo erectus. Homo erectus is the longest, the longest living and surviving Homo species on the planet, over a million years. Homo heidelbergensis, or heidelbergensis, depending upon who pronounces it, 300,000 to 700,000 years ago. Homo heidelbergensis likely or could possibly be one of our direct uh, uh, parent groups. Uh, Homo neanderthalensis, which many people know, Neanderthals 40,000 years ago to 400,000 years ago. Neanderthals are our cousins. Uh, we do not emanate from Neanderthals. There is found uh, human Homo sapien DNA in Neanderthal samples and there is neanderthal dna in some humans so we definitely bred with neanderthals very important to understand this timeline so here we are at the meat and potatoes of this lecture which is the timeline of the human weapon relationship 500,000 years ago, we have what are called the Kathupan spear points. And Kathupan is an area in South Central Africa. And these spear points are 500,000 years old. So why are, let's talk about this for a second. Let me come over here and come back here. All right, so you see humans didn't, have not it did not emerge until 300,000 years ago that's our point of emergence on the planet and we have evidence for that that we were here 300,000 years ago but likely not before these spear points the kathupan spear points are 500,000 years old so that means that there are, are weapons points uh, on the planet before we are on the planet. So these are 200,000 years older than us. Um, who made the Kathupan spear points? Well, no one knows for sure, but it's likely Homo egaster, which would be the African Homo erectus. The Shoningen spears are 300,000 to 400,000 years old, discovered in Shoningen, Germany. Uh, these are aerodynamically considered spears, so they were likely used for thrusting and for throwing. 
They were found in a butchering site along a river bank, and there were thousands of animal bones and a number of wild horse skeletons. Who made the Shonagen spears? Likely Homo heidelbergensis, probably a little bit too early to be Neanderthal. <clears throat> in 279, uh, 279,000 years ago, we have the Ethiopian rift points. So this is central uh, western Africa. I'm sorry, eastern Africa. Found in the Ethiopian rift valley 279,000 years ago. This is likely us, Homo sapiens. So we're we're getting to the point where the first evidence of humans making weapons, right? Pretty, relatively close to the era of our emergence, but it's important that we have the Kathupan spear points and the Shonijin spears because we need to understand just how deep the relationship goes and how far back it goes. How normal is this thing between humans and weapons? Well, it's so normal that you have to measure the relationship between hominins and weapons because weaponry precedes the very existence of our species. And it precedes it by, by a couple hundred thousand years. So weapons are on the planet before we are. Are weapons normal for planet Earth and hominins? Completely, completely. So it's important that we see this data. It's important that we see this information because if now we apply it to the sociopolitical reality, you have neoliberals and progressives and people who, in, in their desire to want the world to be safe from firearms-related injury and death, which is an admirable sentiment, they have a, there are some people that have a tendency to try to skew the actual nature of reality which we know that this happens because we've seen it in the academic realm with progressive people trying to redefine reality based upon their political desires or political sentiments or their political biases. So not only do these people try to demonize uh, weaponry or a relationship with weaponry, they try to redefine the actual nature of things with humans by stating things that support the idea that weapons are an anomaly, they don't matter, they're only used by bad people, uh, they don't belong on the planet. And the reality is, is they're quite normal for the planet. They do belong on the planet. If our earlier ancestors weren't good at weapons, we wouldn't likely be on the planet. Uh, the necessary evolutionary changes that happened from previous hominins to Homo sapien would never have occurred. We were on the planet, or 99% of the time that humans have been on the planet, we were hunter-gatherers. You can't be a successful hunter-gatherer if you're not a successful hunter. So much of what we see now, if you're going to have an honest take on our reality, is dependent upon how successful we were in the past. And we can't be successful in that past if weapons aren't a normal, regular thing that we're good at. And we continue to be good at them, and they continue to be a normal, regular thing. It doesn't mean that there aren't negatives associated, but this bullshit with neoliberals and progressives uh, trying to paint weapons as something that's that are an anomaly and have no meaning, it's entirely unscientific. It's entirely bullshit. It's not even a little bit bullshit. It's gigantic bullshit. And a lot of these same people will be out in the world or online talking about how important science is. But as what I found is when they say that, what they mean is the science that they like that reinforces their bias, not all of the science that's out there. Right. So 70,000 years ago, we have this first exceptional node. And we'll talk about what it means to for, for this to be an exceptional node or what exceptional node means. But 70,000 years ago, we have a composite at lateral dart and spear tip. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Before I go into that, look at that gap between 279,000 years ago and 70,000 years ago. That's a pretty long time. Why, why is that there? Well, there are challenges to arche the archaeological record. And, and one of them is we, there was a glacial period from about 195,000 years ago to 130,000 years ago that we are going to talk about that, a very important glacial period. But there, there weren't a lot of humans on the planet, and that glacial period was challenging and likely drove our numbers down even further. So that we weren't there uh, in a lot of different places. Uh, the organic preservation reality in Africa in, in the ground is difficult and challenging. And during the glacial period, uh, you're likely not to have as much evidence. So, and, and there's a lack of funding for field work and so on and so forth. So you have that kind of a gap there. But the, the reality is with, once you have a modern human, once you have a human that can make the Ethiopian rift points, then making any kind of weapon or projectile, simple projectile or complex is not going to be very difficult for Homo sapiens. Once Homo sapiens can do it, they can always do it, whether they continue to do it or it, that technology and the skills are lost and rediscovered. It doesn't really matter. Humans are just able to continue to do it or rediscover it and continue to do it. So it's more than likely that there were weapons in that gap. Uh, so the composite atlatl dart and spear tip, this is uh, the earliest evidence of complex projectile technology found in the caves of Pinnacle Point at the south coast of South Africa, Curtis Marion's sites. And what you have with the composite atlatl dart and spear tip is the beginning of what I call the Homo sapien weapons industry or Homo sapiens weapon industry or weapons industry. And this is the beginning of the anthropologic weapons industry that is making AR-15s right now. What is happening 70,000 years ago is an industry by the standard definition. So you have pyrotechnic heat treatment of silcrete, warming silcrete stone so it can be worked well. Um, you have a multi-component dart tip which ends up being a sharpened wood point, an antler point, uh, or, or something along those lines. And then you have grooves that are cut into the front of the sharpened point. And then these worked pieces of silcrete, excuse me, these worked pieces of silcrete are very small. They're called microliths, and they're glued into the side of the wood point or the antler point or the bone point was the other one I was trying to think of. They're glued into the side of the point with probably acacia resin, acacia sap, heated. And, um, and then these back uh, pieces are glued into the point. And these back pieces serve a number of, uh, a, a number of um, concepts, right? So it's going to help aerodynamically. It helps with penetration and it helps for the point to not back out. So that tip is then hafted onto a uh, dart shaft, which is like a spear shaft. But the thing is this, this ends up being thrown with the atlatl handle, which is a V shaped handle that allows you to get leverage assistance when you throw. So, uh, this is a, this is what makes a complex prehistoric, uh, projectile uh, a thing right you have the the point itself you have the backed pieces that are uh, glued in you have pyrotechnic heat treatment of silkrete you have heating of of resin from a tree you have hafting you have the crafting of the uh, handle uh, and then you have the application and the throwing so the atlatl allows you to throw that dart about 70 miles an hour. And that basic technology, um, which what it, it can be expressed as something that could kill a woolly rhino or a woolly mammoth, 
And that would mean, though, you need to change the tip out. Like, you can't use that same thin tip if you're going to kill a woolly mammoth with it. You have to have a um, a typical bifacial stone, what would look like a prehistoric spear point. So that would have to be hafted onto the dart shaft and then thrown. Or the other uh, and more advanced, potentially, application of this is what we know is the harpoon. So between the, the bone point with the backed pieces, the bifacial tip to kill the woolly animals or the harpoon, humans go on to use that basic technology. And this is all thrown with leverage assistance. Uh, humans go on to use that technology to kill every known and huntable animal that they can. And that technology can kill any animal on the planet, any size. Uh, so the, the Inuit use the harpoon um, and some other techniques to kill whales, and they can kill whales of any size with it. Uh, the bifacial technology tip, uh, the Native Americans uh, made short work of woolly mammoth with that tip. So any of the, the woolly animal, woolly animals, woolly rhino. Um, and then the basic tip can kill any other type of uh, fauna of other size. So humans can kill anything, including one another with this tip from a distance, right? So that's the composite atlatl dart and spear tip. The Sabudu arrow points. Uh, these are Sabudu, I, I believe is also uh Western is it? It's Eastern Africa again. Eastern Africa. This is our earliest example of bow and arrow, and that's very very important because we're seeing a progression and a change in projectile weaponry. Uh, then twelve thousand years ago, we have the Natufian arrow points, which um, uh, the Natufian arrow points are found in the Middle East and the Levant. And this is an exceptional node because, based upon some people's theory, this is where we start to see the era. Well, this is actually based upon uh, Paul Bingham's theory, which is we start to see the democratization of weaponry and in large scale. So, once we reach 20,000, well, actually, once we reach about 40, 25 to 40,000 years ago, you start to see. Uh, projectile technology tips and samples in the archaeological record by the hundreds of thousands in the Middle East and around the Mediterranean. So there are humans have made it out of Africa about 70,000 years ago ish was the, the main out of Africa migration that stuck. And so once we make it into the Middle East and we're around the Mediterranean, we're doing very well, relatively speaking, as a species. There are a lot of different tribes. We are reproducing and we are all over the place. And with that all over the place comes projectiles all over the place. And it is theorized by Bingham, and I think it's a, it's a salient idea, that you start to see a sharing of technologies around this time between tribes. And this likely means that you have the first example of mutually assured destruction and humans starting to understand that killing one another and fighting one another is costly, that it might be better to try something else like being better at communication, diplomacy, etc. So, uh, this sharing of technologies shows that between groups, we're cooling it out a little bit. And so one of the main contributors to this is what's known as the democratization of local weaponry. So there are so many projectiles and people are so good at using them that it creates a low level, tribal level, mutually assured destruction. And this changes the risk benefit analysis for human groups and human societies and so we change how we do things and so this exceptional node shows us the first example of what when people are talking about 2a and how important it is for freedom in america and having control and not having other entities having dominance of you well that's not actually the first example of that 
That's a later example of that. We've already achieved that as a species, and it was likely in the Middle East before we settled down in the Fertile Crescent and started to take on agriculture. Uh, everything changes after that, unfortunately, <laughs> because we have to start protecting crops and protecting fertile lands. Humans go from this democratized, mutually assured destruction, go out of it, and then go into this place where we become more aggressive and um, more focused on warfare. And our modern warfare habits are likely driven out of that era. So we're out of the realm of mutually assured destruction, and we go into something even more intense. About 5000 BCE, we get to the ancient warrior combat loadout, and this is what you would typically see in a medieval warrior, where you have some sort of armor assemblages, helmets, uh, cutting weapons, slicing weapons, bludgeoning weapons. Um, potentially, you have the use of horse and chariot or horse and carriage, which ends up being very effective. It ends up driving, it ends up being the driving force for weaponry for about a thousand years from a thousand BCE to uh, you know, the time of Christ. So uh, it's an amalgam and, and archery and, and bow and arrows in that. So it's an amalgam of weaponry that uh, humans are engaged in that kind of push the reality. The projectile is still a big player. When you have uh, uh, archers scaled up, it can certainly be decisive. So the the projectile is still in there, but it's sort of a um, it's amorphous for a time. Um, whereas projectiles through the rest of the timeline are typically the dominant um, technology. So the ancient warrior combat loadout is important. When, when we start to master the metals and we start to master making plate armor and chain armor, this changes things with the projectile. The bow and arrow uh, is not quite as decisive because it's foiled by plate armor. Um, and this forces humans to start to consider this other technology that we had been dealing with, which is cannon technology and gunpowder technology and the early hand cannons and the smaller cannons, humans start to uh, consider this as a way to foil armor. And so where that ends up going is what we have now, which is the rifle, the musket, the rifle, and the pistol. Once we have usable forms of the rifle and muskets, this foils plate armor well, and it foils it for a while, and then it basically makes plate armor obsolete. And so once we get to the point where we have an effective firearm that can be regularly reproduced, and then the average everyday person can afford it because early rifles and early muskets were not affordable to the everyday person, they were expensive. Um, the lock mechanisms, the handcrafted stocks, everyday people couldn't afford them. So once we get to the point where we have an effective firearm that can be reasonably reproduced and afforded uh, by the average everyday person, we have what I call the effective firearm. And that happens around 1650. Certainly by the time we're into the 18th century, that's what we have. And here we have again the democratization of weaponry. So just like in 12,000, just like 12,000 years ago in the Middle East, we start to have a democratization of the leading projectile mechanism, and it starts to shift how things are done in society and the effects of society. And the best example of what happens with this new democratization of projectiles is the United States of America. That's an exceptional node on the timeline. And Firearms, the rifle, the pistol don't ever move outside of that position, and they still haven't. So they are the most important democratized projectile mechanism on the planet. 
giving everyday humans the ability to change history and to define events and define the future from the standpoint of the time, the human weapon relationship. Um, and then in, in 1940, we have the military aircraft loadout, which starts to push into like fighter jets and sidewinders, which is uh, a lot of superior force. And then we could argue that that goes into nuclear weaponry. But what matters the most here is that in terms of the democratization of weaponry, uh, even today, the firearm is much more important in this analysis than nuclear weapons are, because ultimately people have to be in charge of jets and people have to be in charge of nuclear silos. And those people are typically guarding those things or dealing with those things with firearms involved. So uh, for the everyday person and relative to these other more superior projectile types, the firearm is still an enormous, uh, um, an enormous mechanism of social power for humans. All right. So that's the timeline of the weapon, human weapon relationship. Quick breakdown, not so quick, but a uh, simple breakdown. These are the Kathu Pan stone points. Again, South Central Africa, 500,000 years old. Likely Homo, Ag Homo agaster. That's African Homo erectus, 200,000 years before humans are on the planet. These are the Shoningen spears, aerodynamically considered, likely thrown. They're called javelins sometimes by scientists. So the first examples of true simple projectiles. How extensive is the human weapon relationship? It's so extensive that you have to measure it before humans are even on the planet. You have to go to the hominin weapon relationship. So weapons are on the planet before humans are on the planet. These are the Ethiopian rift points, the earliest example of Homo sapiens making projectile tips or uh, not projectile tips. Well, yeah, there, there is an argument that some of these were for simple spear. So whether it's a projectile or for thrusting, this is the earliest example that we have. And it's likely that some of these were used for tips on a spear that was thrown. Um, so the earliest example of that. But this is certainly humans, and it's about 280,000 years ago. All right, these are the microliths from South Africa, Pinnacle Point, Curtis Marion's work sites. Earliest example of complex projectile technology on the planet. This is the beginning of the Homo sapien weapons industry. So heat treatment, pyrotechnic heat treatment of that silcrete core that you see on the bottom. Uh, it gets worked. It gets cracked off. Two of them get cracked off. They get worked some more. They get glued into the side of the projectile point. That point gets added to the shaft, and that whole thing, that whole assemblage, gets thrown by the atlatl handle. These are the Subudu points. Uh, the one hypothesis is that they, they are, many of them are used for bow and arrow but used for different, potentially, uh, certainly the smaller ones, uh, used for other uh, purposes, projectile purposes, but samples of the uh, earliest bow and arrow, uh, arrow points. It was whatever, the, it was 60-ish thousand years ago, 64. And this is the Natufian arrow point, Middle East, 12,000 years ago. This is part of the contribution to the democratization of weaponry and 
hunter-gatherer mutually assured destruction. And I would like to talk about this for a second. This is not a projectile point, and it's likely not a weapon, although we're not sure, possibly. It is a tool used for digging, grinding, cutting. It is called an Ashelaian hand axe. This one is exquisite. It's Both pictures are the same hand axe. The one on the left is fresher out of the ground. The one on the right is what happens with oxidation once it's in the a museum. So it's banded ironstone, and it is exquisite. Could most humans make this today? Likely not. Likely not. So, if you think about what kind of a mind or approach it would take to make something like this and make something so beautiful. It could have been an accident that it was beautiful, but I doubt it. Whatever mind could make this could make a lot of other things. Right, And certainly whatever mind could make this could potentially make a basic spear. But but what is most important about this Ashley and hand axe is that it is 800,000 years old. It was found in Kathupan, South Central Africa, where the Kathupan points were found. And this is likely Homo agaster. African Homo erectus, Homo erectus, 500,000 years before humans are on the planet. This was made a half of a million years before humans are even a thing. If Homo erectus can make this, Homo sapiens, who are arguably superior to Homo erectus cognitively and technologically, then Homo sapiens can make spear points and arrow points and whenever they feel like it. Whenever they want to discover it or rediscover it or continue it, they can do it. But this is an amazing piece, and it shows that there are things going on before Homo sapiens are even on the planet that are vital or important uh, relative to survival. So these kinds of technologies, whether it's the Ashland hand axe or projectile technologies, they're so important that they precede human beings.